So this video will discuss high-risk pregnancy, um, starting with assessment of the high-risk individual as well as specific tests that we do um, to further assess those that are at high risk, um, and then ending with discussions of specific um, high-risk situations, whether they are pre-existing conditions of the mother or um, conditions that develop during pregnancy known as gestational conditions. So there are different categories of high-risk factors. Um, in your textbook on page 227, it does talk about the, the different high-risk factors. And as you look at it, you'll realize there are tons of factors that can create a high-risk situation. Basically, any factor that creates even a potential for impaired outcomes um, for either the mother and or the baby puts you in a high risk category. This can be pre-existing conditions. This can be conditions that develop um, within uh, the, the time period that they're pregnant. It can be um, things like socioeconomic status. It can be substance abuse. But the most common cause of high risk um, pregnancies and births is lack of prenatal care. Um, so prenatal care is very important because we not only use prenatal care to screen for um, diseases, or not diseases, but situations that come up, like for instance, gestational diabetes. Um, women that develop this may often not have symptoms of it, but without realizing that they have it, it can cause significantly poor outcomes for herself as well as her baby. So um, we prenatal care helps to screen. It also provides an avenue for education so that um, these women can be educated on um, how to properly take care of themselves and factors that can affect their pregnancy. So there are a few um, terminologies that we'll use related to high risk um, or related to complications of birth. If you look at the picture right there, um, both of these babies were born full term, same gestation. It's not where one baby is preterm and the other is full term. They were both the same term. Um, and this is something called intrauterine growth restriction. The baby you see on the left would be described as that. Intrauterine growth restriction means there is some factor that caused that baby not to grow properly. Um, one of the most common ones is hypertension. Um, if you have high blood pressure, um, then your blood vessels are constricted, and when they're constricted, you're not going to have as great a blood flow, which means you're going to have decreased oxygenation de and decreased nutrition to baby. Um, so this is one of the big um, most common causes of IUGR. Um, and, and that can be from another factor. For example, if you have a mother who smokes tobacco or um, uses cocaine, those cause hypertension. So it's the hypertension that's causing the problem secondarily due to um, that su those substances being used. So um, this is when the baby is not grow does not grow to the same size um, as they should based on their gestation, not necessarily being preterm. Um, a couple of terms that you'll see regarding amount of amniotic fluid, polyhydramnios and oligohydramnios. And there are lots of things that can cause this. Diabetes, for example, can cause polyhydramnios. Um, oligo, um, oligohydramnios, that can be related to um, the, the fetus having a, um, a kidney dysfunction. So there's lots of things, and we won't go into the specifics of what all can cause it, um, but polyhydramnios is where you have too much amniotic fluid. Oligohydramnios is where you don't have enough amniotic fluid, and this is important. We want to, um, going back to the normal pregnancy video, we want to make sure there's an adequate amount of fluid because it maintains temperature um, allows for fetal movement, it provides protection, um, prevents infection, so it's really important that there's an adequate amount of fluid. Um, you don't want too much or too little. Um, and one of the ways we can measure for this is when um, doing the um, fundal testing, um, the, the fundal measurements that they will do starting usually at 18 weeks of gestation where you take a tape measure measuring from the pubis symphysis up to the fundus of the uterus and that should measure within two centimeters um, either way of their their gestation at the time. And that's one of the things that it can tell us is if there's an inadequate amount of fluid as well as other things. <laughs> 
So when we're talking about specific testing that women do um, that are high risk, now these often are not things that everyone does. It's just for high risk pregnancies. Um, the first one is easy to be done at home called a daily fetal kick count or a daily fetal movement count. Um, this is where women do this at home. They sit down for um, say half an hour or an hour at a time um, and they feel for how many times that um, they feel baby movements. Normal movement are about 30 movements per hour but what we want those women to know and what's important for you to know is that alarm sign when they feel less than three movements in an hour that is concerning um, now it might not be anything more than babies just sleeping so if the woman calls her provider and says that she doesn't feel the baby moving as much they might have her just drink some juice or, or get up and walk around things that will stimulate the baby and see if it changes if it doesn't change after that then they will probably do a further evaluation in the office to make sure there's nothing going on um, that's abnormal. So ultrasound is something that we use on every pregnant woman. Um, how frequently you get it done will depend on how high risk you are. Um, somebody who is of what you call normal risk, um, that there's no factors that increase their risk, typically get ultrasounds done once a tri or yeah once a trimester um, so three times in a pregnancy is the average uh, but women who are high risk may get them as much as once a week um, depending on the the significance of their risk so ultrasound is good for anatomy um, it helps us look at measurements um, it helps us look at anatomical defects it helps us see gender um, helps us see baby moving so this is good for anatomy um, you're being able to visualize the baby. Um, it is pretty much no risk. Um, it works by sound as opposed to like x-ray or anything like radiation. So there's no risk involved with that. Um, there's two types. There's abdominal or transvaginal. Transvaginal is important earlier in pregnancy because early in pregnancy the baby has not come or the fetus has not come up above the pubic bone and these sound waves cannot see so to speak through um, bone so you have to use a transvaginal in order to visualize the baby and it's a wand that's inserted into the vagina and instead of seeing through the abdomen you're looking up through the cervix um, to see the fetus and the placenta and all the other structures so earlier on in pregnancy this is used and then um, as the fetus grows and comes over that pubic bone, then abdominal becomes um, the best way to visualize that baby. So electronic fetal monitoring, when we talk about labor and delivery, is where we're really going to detail of how to analyze fetal heart tones as far as um, the heart rate accelerating, accelerating, decelerating, and what that means. Um, External, there's two types of fetal monitoring. There's external fetal monitor, which is what most people um, know as fetal monitoring, where they put the two kind of pucks on your abdomen. One is reading the fetal heart rate. The other one is reading the, the contractions. But being that it's external, there are factors that can interfere with that. Um, but for most people, it's enough. It's enough to let us see what's going on. But if you have somebody who's really high risk and you need very specific intervention, um, information without a lot of interference. For example, if you need um, to know the specific um, strength of the contractions and numbers, not just when they're occurring and getting an idea of how strong they are, you can do internal fetal monitoring as well. So this does require, it is highly risky, um, much more so than external fetal monitoring because it's internal, high risk of infection, potentially trauma to baby, Membranes have to be ruptured in order for this to be done. Um, they take a little tiny needle um, and stick it into baby's scalp as the probe to measure their heart rate. And then there's a catheter that's put up in the uterus alongside baby to measure the contraction. So if you really need something specific um, and more closely monitored, they can do internal monitoring, but it is more invasive and more risky. So it is safer, high-risk situations. Now, 
What you need to know as far as what we're talking about today is a couple of the tests that are done using fetal monitoring. And that's the non-stress test and the contraction stress test. These are very important that you understand the differences in the two and how you read those and how you interpret those. Um, so on page 242 in your textbook or page 35 in your ATI book um, talks about these important tests. So when we're talking about a non-stress test, it's non stress to the baby, meaning mom just sits there um, and she has a little clicker in her hand. So as she's sitting there, if she feels baby move, she clicks on the clicker, which is what you see down here where you see these little spikes on that first picture. And every time you see the spikes, you correlate what their heart rate is doing. So in non-stress tests, you're looking for acceleration. So you're looking for increases in the heart rate. And as you see from this picture right here, this heart rate looks great. This is a reactive non-stress test, which means it's good. I'm, so, I'm sorry, re yeah, reactive non-stress test. So it's good. It, the baby's heart rate is reacting to movements. So you want them to be reactive. That is um, what we're looking for. Um, so accelerations with the non-stress test we use the terminology of reactive versus non-reactive. Um, baby's just sitting there, not stressed out, not in labor, um, just hanging out and, and floating around. Um, now, the contraction stress test is where we're putting baby under stress. So this is where they're trial, trialing to see if baby can tolerate labor. Um, so in this case, we're looking for decelerations or, or um drops in the heart rate. And these are not something we want. So we want accelerations. In the non-stress test, we want it to be reactive. But in the contraction stress test, we use positive or negative. We want it to be negative. Negative equals normal. Um, so if they are having decelerations, that's when we call it positive. Um, and we will talk about this, especially in labor and delivery in more detail. Decelerations um, that you would see in this case, which would be late decelerations, are concerning for fetal compromise. It means baby is having some kind of hypoxia or not tolerating the contractions well. Um, so this they'll do to see if they can go through with labor, if they're concerned that baby won't do well through labor, um, and if baby doesn't do well, then they'll have to do a C-section. Um, the problem with a contraction stress test is it can bring on labor that cannot be stopped. So women who have a contraction stress test done should only have it done if they are far enough along that you would be willing to birth that baby if necessary, um, because sometimes those contractions can't be stopped. Um, so contraction stress tests, um, most commonly they'll use nipple stimulation to start those contractions. When you have nipple stimulation, stimulation, it releases natural oxytocin in your body. And oxytocin is a drug that we give that helps stimulate uterine contractions, but it's something our body also produces naturally as well. It helps stimulate those contractions. When we talk about postpartum, we'll talk about how um, when with breastfeeding, um, the nipple stimulation releases oxytocin. It helps prevent postpartum hemorrhage. So our bodies kind of work together in different ways of um, decreasing our risk of complications. So nipple stimulation will help de release some oxytocin, which will stimulate some of those contractions. So if they do the non-stress test, and that's the one that you see on the left-hand side that we're looking for accelerations, baby just sitting there, and we're, we're not seeing accelerations. We have a non-reactive, non-stress test. Then the next step could be a biophysical profile. So a biophysical profile is where you're using ultrasound to really look more in-depth at what baby is doing. So you're looking at the specific criteria you see on the screen, looking at fetal breathing movements, muscle tone, um, the amount of amniotic fluid. Um, babies in utero are breathing. Now, as we know, they're not breathing for gas exchange because gas exchange takes place through the umbilical cord via the placenta um, with mom. But they are still making breathing movements because those muscles are practicing for when baby comes out. Um, they already know how to work to oxygenate baby. And um, you'll see those practice movements, so gauging those. Um, we can get the score and be more specific um, and put an objective number on how well baby's doing 
as opposed to um, more subjective, doing okay, not doing okay. So this is kind of that definitive word of how baby is doing. So one of the tests that can be done early on in pregnancy is called an amniocentesis. And actually, there's a couple times that amniocentesis is used. The other one we will talk about in labor and delivery. But for the purpose of today, um, when we're talking about high-risk pregnancy, um, we're talking about amniocentesis that's done at the beginning of the second trimester. So typically, amniocentesis for this is done around week 14. And the reason it can't be done earlier than that is because you need enough fluid in order to withdraw um, to, to do testing. So amniocentesis is where they will withdraw some amniotic fluid. They pierce a, as you can see from the picture, they pierce a, a needle through the abdomen and through the, um, the umbilical sac and then, um, I'm sorry, amniotic sac, and then they withdraw some amniotic fluid, um, and they can do genetic testing for this. So um, genetic testing is the main reason they would do it at this stage um, to, to look for genetic defects, um, especially if you have a high risk um, of a genetic defect in a family, if there's known genetic defects, um, if you have a mom who's over age 35, because at that point she's considered geriatric, um, and it greatly increases her risk of having genetic complications of the fetus. Um, if there are any, if mom has had multiple miscarriages, that can be a sign of genetic defects, and they may do genetic testing then as well. Um, so amniocentesis can also tell us gender um, as part of that genetic makeup, but they will not do this test just to determine gender because it is highly um, risky. Um, piercing the amniotic sac with a needle means there's a potential that that hole will not close back up and you can actually rupture the amniotic sac and cause them to lose the pregnancy. So it is not without risk um, by no means and it's something that really is reserved for if you really need to know um, the genetic um, potential of a certain genetic defects. Another one that's kind of similar and they can do a little bit earlier um, is chorionic villi sampling. So instead of withdrawing amniotic fluid, they're using the chorionic villi, which are the little fingers um, that come off of the yolk sac that attach to the um, to the uterus that becomes the placenta, um, where the placenta attaches. Um, so instead of withdrawing fluid, they can take off some of those fingerling projections um, that are attaching um, the baby to the uterus and, and test those. They can be done a little bit earlier, usually around 10 weeks at the earliest, uh, but if they need earlier genetic testing, this can be used as well. Um, it's a little bit of a higher risk of spontaneous abortion than amniocentesis is, um, but it is, if necessary, um, something that can be done to, to get earlier genetic makeup um, knowledge. And then with our maternal assays, things that are, are tested on the mom to indicate risks of certain things. Um, so one of the big, big ones we focus on that you should know is maternal alpha fetoprotein or AFP levels. Um, very important for you to know this. So this is typically drawn around 15 the 15th week, so mid-second trimester, um, and this is blood that's drawn from mom, um, and this blood can indicate to us certain defects. So if it is low, maternal alpha fetoprotein that's low can indicate Down syndrome. Think of low and down, um, so Down syndrome. If it's high, we associate it with most commonly what it is associated with is spinal um, bifida um, or neural tube defects where the spinal column didn't close properly, but lots of things that did not close properly can cause an elevated maternal alpha fetoprotein. So think of it as an anatomy thing when it's high. If it's high, it can tell us that something didn't close. So for example, the, the neural tube defect, it could be a cleft palate in the mouth. It could be a hole in the heart. It could be something called gastroschisis, which is where the abdominal wall doesn't close all the way and the intestines are born on the outside of the body. Um, so th when you think of high, think of something did not close the way it's supposed to close as, as the fetus was developing. Mm -hmm. 
So there are two categories of conditions that you see in pregnancy that can increase your risk. Either pre-existing conditions, meaning the mom already had that problem before she got pregnant, um, which those can um, cause problems with pregnancy just as much as um, newly um, developed conditions or what we call gestational conditions, things that develop um, that she did not have when she got pregnant and develop usually after the 20th week um, for most of them. Um, so the first one we'll talk about is diabetes. And um, we're going to talk about pre-existing and gestational here um, just because the management of it really doesn't vary. Um, it's still managed the same way. So I won't talk about type 1 and type 2 diabetes that much um, just because by now y'all know what those are. Gestational diabetes is where you have somebody who did not have diabetes before and develops diabetes during pregnancy. If you already have diabetes, you still have diabetes when you get pregnant. It doesn't become gestational diabetes. Um, when we're talking about gestational diabetes, it's more common than most people realize. Um, and gestational diabetes does go away once the mom gives birth to the baby. The problem is about 50% of people that develop Gestational diabetes will develop type 2 diabetes within 10 years after that pregnancy. So it is, even though it goes away after they give birth, it's very common for it to um, re-come back as type 2 diabetes later on in life. Um, so when we're talking about diabetes, um, there's two things that are a little bit different in pregnancy that you'll need to know. One is their risk of hypoglycemia. And that first trimester, um, if they stay on their same regimen that they have been using um, pre-pregnancy, um, they are at a high risk of hypoglycemia because their body gets really good at controlling itself for, um, for glucose management um, because it recognizes it's supporting another human being and it, it needs to make the factor work a little bit better. So it gets really good at processing glucose. So if women stay on their current regimen um, into that first trimester of pregnancy, um, much higher risk of developing hypoglycemia. So they will often back up, back off on their regimen for the first trimester. And then starting in the second trimester, they can go back up to um, based on their, their presentation, whatever regimen they need. Another difference is the treatment. Um, Type 2 diabetics often are able to take oral anti-diabetic agents, like, for example, metformin. Um, but these are contraindicated in pregnancy. Most of them are. And the reason for this is it crosses the placental barrier. Um, so these medications are not only affecting mom's pancreas and mom's uptake of glucose, but also the fetuses as well, which can cause issues um, with the baby's pancreas. So because these do cross the placental barrier for most of them, um, moms who are type 2 that are on those oral anti-diabetic agents will usually be switched to, to pure insulin as their treatment regimen just during pregnancy. So they'll still monitor their blood glucose the same way, um, but they'll be using insulin instead of their oral agents um, because insulin does not cross the placental barrier. So giving mom exogenous insulin is not going to affect um, that baby but giving her oral anti-diabetic agents can affect that baby. Um, so these are not typically re recommended. Um, but other than that, regimen is the same. They're still going to monitor their blood glucose several times a day. Um, the dietary recommendations are still the same as far as low-carbohydrate diets um, and um, tight glycemic, or not tight, but um, good glycemic control is the best indicator of outcome. So if they are having blood sugars that in the three and four hundreds throughout most of their pregnancy, they have a much higher risk of somebody um, of having complications either for herself or for that baby, as opposed to somebody that maintains, you know, less than 200. So the amount of glycemic control definitely greatly affects um, the potential for, for poor outcomes. So there are lots of complications that can happen from diabetes to both mom and to baby. Um, there can be difficulties with maintaining the pregnancy. It can result in stillbirths. Um, it can result in increased risk of infections. Um, a lot, it can also result in trauma related to the birth itself. So when you think of diabetes, gestational diabetes, I want you to think of the word macrosomia. So macrosomia is a large baby. Um, um, this is a, it's over 4,500 
um, grams is the definition. So four and a half kilos. Um, this is a large baby. Um, and the reason this is a concern is because a large baby is going to have more difficulty um, exiting out of the birth canal. It can cause more birth canal trauma to mom. It can also cause something we'll talk about in labor and delivery called shoulder dystocia. Baby's trying to come out, but because of the size of baby, their shoulder gets stuck on that pubic bone and they're stuck in the birth canal and it's an emergency. Um, so just the sheer size of the baby being uh, um, macrosomic. And the reason they become macrosomic is because of all the sugar they're getting from mom. Um, all that sugar builds up. The more sugar you get, the more weight you gain. So they develop um, as a larger baby. Um, it can also cause hypoglycemia. And this is something we'll really focus on when we talk about newborns in a few weeks. Um, but it it can make them very high risk of hypoglycemia in the first 24 hours after life. And the reason, the babies, not the mothers. And the reason for this is that fetus's pancreas has been working at a high level to match mom's high blood sugar for months. And all of a sudden, baby's born and their pancreas is going to take a day to stabilize and get back down to regulating based on their new um, amount of glucose they're taking in, but it doesn't happen right away. So their pancreas is still working at this high level and they're not getting that high level of sugar anymore. So they are your priority patients because they have such a high risk of dropping their blood sugar. Um, they really have to be monitored. So how do we know if a woman has gestational diabetes? A lot of times with gestational diabetes, they are not going to be symptomatic. Um, they may get in repeated infections, like maybe they're getting a bunch of UTIs or something like that. That's possible, just like you see in diabetics that are not pregnant, um, but sometimes they have no symptoms at all. Um, and we can do testing for this. Every single woman that gets prenatal care gets tested with an oral glucose tolerance test between uh, usually 24 to 28 weeks of gestation, because that's most likely when it will develop by then. So during this test, there's, there's two parts potentially to this test. The first one is for everybody, and it's a one-hour test. It's a non-fasting test. You go into the doctor's office, and they have you drink a uh, glucose solution that's 50 grams of carbs, um, and you sit there for an hour. And then after an hour, they draw your blood, and they test it to see where your blood sugar levels are um, compared to an hour after ingesting the solution. Um, if your values are elevated, usually 130 to 140. Uh, if it's above that, that's what they're looking at. Then you come back again and you have to do a fasting three-hour test. So with the fasting three-hour hour test, it is fasting. This time they give you 100 grams of carbs instead of 50 and you get tested twice. So they'll do blood testing at an hour and then they'll do blood testing again at three hours to see how you respond to that increased glucose. Um, if that is also elevated, then then that is when they will diagnose you with gestational diabetes um, and begin the process of educating on um, insulin management and uh, potentially insulin management, dietary management, and um, blood glucose monitoring. Um, depending on the severity, they, they will try and just use diet um, and exercise first, exercise as tolerated, um, to, to decrease the need to go on insulin. Um, but if that does not manage their blood glucose levels um, in an appropriate range, then they will resort to measures of insulin as well for these patients. So one thing that can be potentially troubling for baby is if mom has phenylketonuria or PKU. So to recap, PKU or phenylketonuria is where you can't process phenylalanine. They're lacking the enzyme to process it, which phenylalanine is an amino acid, so it's found in proteins. So patients that have this, um, this is screened for in the newborn screening test. Again, we'll talk about that when we get to newborns. So they know um, well before or, um, they're having babies that they have this usually, um, but it is important for us to reiterate their need to stick to their dietary regimen that they have to stick to, i.e. the low protein diet. Because even if baby doesn't have PKU, 
if mom is not eating that low protein diet, she's still processing those byproducts that are passing through the placenta and getting to baby and causing permanent neurological dysfunction. Even if baby doesn't have PKU and mom has it, she's still creating those byproducts that are going to cause problems for baby. So pre-existing cardiovascular disorders. So when women have previous heart um, issues, it can create a lot of havoc on their body. Um, being pregnant alone, it can be stressful on your body, especially the cardiac system discussed in the normal um, pregnancy information was about how much extra fluid our body takes on. Our body takes on about 50% more fluid or about two to three liters of extra blood volume. So that's a huge strain on the heart. If you have a heart that is already diseased, it can really make a difference in their outcome. So there are various different classes anywhere from somebody who has a very mild cardiovascular problem that may not even need bed rest until closer to the end, may not really be on any kind of significant restrictions, all the way up to class five where you have significant intolerance of even just day-to-day -day life. They're often on bed rest. They're probably not going to be having a vaginal birth, they're probably going to have a scheduled C-section, um, very high risk of going into cardiac failure with these patients. Um, oftentimes when you're at that level, these are women that are probably advised not to get pregnant to begin with. Um, so your biggest risk that you worry about with cardiovascular is that they will go um, into um, congestive heart failure, um, which absolutely can happen. And this is can happen at different times. Um, it can happen um, during pregnancy. Um, it can happen during labor, or it can happen postpartum. Just because they've given birth to baby doesn't mean they're out of the clear. So what are the symptoms of cardiac decompensation? Um, here are the symptoms um, to revisit that from med surge. So things like crackles in their lungs, things like a widening pulse pressure or weak pulses, um, things like um, a cough. Um, these can all be or increasing fatigue. Um, some of them can be vague. Fatigue, for example, all pregnant women get fatigue in some level, um, but this would be um, a noticeable sudden change for them. So when we're talking about different stages, um, the antepartum, intrapartum, and postpartum, um, there are different factors that increase that risk. For example, I mentioned in antepartum, which is during pregnancy, how all that extra fluid puts extra strain on the heart. Well, in postpartum, that fluid has to go somewhere. In the first 24 to 48 hours, something we'll talk about in postpartum is women lose a lot of fluid. They pee a lot and they sweat a lot. Um, and it's totally normal. It's just the body getting rid of all that extra fluid. Um, but that sudden shift of fluid can also create problems for the mom. So um, looking at making sure that she is tolerating um, the movements of fluid. And of course, during during labor, um, there's a lot of strain on the heart. It's a lot of work. It, it's labor intensive, no pun intended. And it is um, can put a strain on even somebody without pre-existing conditions, but then you take a cardiac defect, it can really push them over the edge. So if you have patients in a more severe um, cardiac situation, a more severe class, more than likely they're going to be scheduled for a C-section before they could even get to being um, going into labor on their own. Now, probably the most common um, abnormality that you see in pregnancy is anemia. Um, and usually it is iron deficiency, not folic acid deficiency, although we promote the, the use of both, um, more so the folic acid for neural tube defects. So anemia is where there's not enough red blood cells. Um, it could be from nutrition where they're not eating enough to sustain um, the creation of those red blood cells at an appropriate amount. Um, but more than likely, it's dilutional anemia. So like I was just talking about with cardiac, that you um, you take on all this extra fluid during pregnancy. It's like if you take a cup of red blood cells and dump water in it, it dilutes them. So if you draw a sample, there's not going to be as many. Um, and that dilutional anemia um, is often what a big part of it is. So they may be on oftentimes your... Prenatal vitamins that are recommended have a, a much higher dose of iron than your 
typical um, multivitamin. Um, so that can help with some of that um, anemia as well. Um, but the reason we get concerned about anemia is if you don't have enough red blood cells, you're not going to have enough to transmit things like nutrients and oxygen, oxygen especially. So then that can cause things like IUGR for the baby um, and things like that. So we want to make sure that they have appropriate iron and folic acid levels. Um, one of the symptoms that you'll see related to anemia is called pica. Um, so pica is where you eat non-nutritive items, not necessarily non-food items. It could be things like ice. It could be cornstarch. Um, but these are things like you're not going to eat cornstarch by the spoonful typically. This is more for cooking. But these patients will eat eat it by the spoonful. They'll eat clay, um, laundry soap, things like that. So um, it's where they have this craving for it. And what's causing them to have those cravings is the anemia. So that is what is associated with it in pregnancy. And then our last pre-existing condition is substance abuse. Substance abuse is highly more common than most of us realize, um, in, especially in the prenatal world. Um, there are many different um, drugs that can affect the fetus. A lot of these drugs are things we don't always know what their effect is. For example, alcohol. Our current recommendation for alcohol consumption during pregnancy is zero. And the reason for this is we cannot identify an appropriate level um, during pregnancy. It is, un it is against the ethics of research to directly research or study pregnant women. Um, you can obtain data based on what you've seen. Like if a, a mom takes a medication and they have these effects, you can um, get data analysis from that, but you can't actually create a controlled research study with a control group um, getting a placebo and a, a study group getting um, a medication or a drug. So um, because of this, we have a lot of things in our world um, that we say no to during pregnancy, not always because we know it's bad, but sometimes because we don't know an appropriate amount. And alcohol is one of those. Some providers will say you can have a, a couple glasses of wine a week and you'll be fine. Um, but they cannot definitively say that with scientific background. So the current recommendation is absolutely not. Um, other ones, tobacco, opioids, cocaine, methamphetamines, those are the most common illicit drugs that you see. Um, and these can all have different effects on the baby. So on page 276 in your textbook, it talks about the effects of each of these drugs, and you should definitely review that and get to know um that information of how each drug affects the fetus. Um, one of the big ones we focus on in the prenatal world is called neonatal abstinence syndrome, uh, which is related to opioids. Um, neonatal abstinence syndrome is where they are withdrawing from opioids. And um, this is not going to occur from the mom who just got morphine during labor. This occurs from months of exposure um, to these opioids. And these babies, um, when they are born, um, they are very irritable. They are very fussy. Um, they don't want to eat. They don't want to sleep. They have a really high-pitched, um, whiny type of cry. Um, they're very jittery. That's one of the big things you see. They jitter. They shake. Um, and if you click on the video um, that's shown right here, which it's not going to come up appropriately with for me with this recording but if you go to the the powerpoints on um on y'all side and you click on that link it will take you to a really good video that shows you what that looks like um the, those jitters that baby get in real time so there's two thought processes for treating abstinence uh, neonatal abstinence um one is to um give them tapering doses of morphine um which is understandable because you want baby to, to be comfortable. You don't want them to suffer through withdrawal. Um, the problem with tapers is they take months. Um, these are not quick fixes. They take months, and they often um, you have to go backwards before you can go forward. So they're, they're difficult. And when you think about sending a baby home to a mom who was using the opioids in the first place, sending them home with morphine is not always a great solution. So uh, the, the newer thing, 
thought process that you're seeing more and more is just cold turkey. Um, letting the, just stopping everything, not giving them anything, and letting the baby kind of suffer through it. Uh, which sounds horrible and cruel, um, but instead of months it's over in a couple days. So um, it, it is a quicker process. It's safer for them to go home that way because honestly, most of these babies are going home with the mothers that were the substance abusers. There's nowhere to put them. Um, so it's safer for them to go home that way. Um, and it is, there's no studies that show a difference in long-term outcomes of tapering versus cold turkey. Now, they will have long-term consequences of just the exposure in the womb of these illicit drugs, but not the specific way that they're taken off of them um, makes a difference. So you're seeing more and more where providers are choosing the cold turkey route because it's quicker and it's safer in the long run for these babies. So now we'll talk about some gestational conditions, ones that develop during pregnancy that weren't pre-existing. Um, besides diabetes, another big one that you see that um, develops during pregnancy is hypertension. And there's different things that go together with these hypertensive um, um, disorders associated with pregnancy. So uh, three main categories, you've got just hypertension, you've got preeclampsia, and you've got eclampsia. So when we're talking about gestational hypertension, that's all you have is high blood pressure, and it's after 20 weeks that it begins. Um, no previous history of blood of hypertension, um, so they did not have high blood pressure before they became pregnant. If that's the case, they just continue to have high blood pressure. They don't have gestational hypertension. So gestational hypertension is just the high blood pressure. Same parameters as we use for any other adult, the 140 over 90 with at least um, readings on at least two other two separate visits so that way we're we are sure it's not anything that's um external factors affecting their blood pressure so 140 over 90 and it is just hypertension so in order to be have preeclampsia and it's not that these necessarily go in order you don't get hypertension then preeclampsia and then eclampsia sometimes you can skip them um, and just go straight on or sometimes it can be very short you go into the hospital and your blood pressure is sky high and then before you know it you're having a seizure so um, it can vary as far as the length of time that these um, progress or even just skipping over so Preeclampsia is where you you have the hypertension, the blood pressure of greater than 140 over 90, um, but with this you also have protein in the urine or protein urea. Um, this is one of the reasons that they check a urine on on pregnant women every single visit. Is this is one of the things they're looking for is potentially protein in the urine. So then. Eclampsia is where they have convulsions or coma. They have seizures, um, and that's what we give um, magnesium sulfate for in preeclampsia, not for the blood pressure, but to help prevent um, that seizure activity. So when we're talking about preeclampsia, there are tons of risk factors. Diabetes is one of them. Um, the, if they're very young, if they're teen, or if they're older, over that age of 35, that increases their risk. Um, if they have a multifetal pregnancy, if there's a history of it in their family, or if they've ever had it before, they are more likely to get it um, again or get it themselves. Um, so... There is, if you want to see the pathophysiology, um, this kind of gives you a chart of, and you do not need to memorize this by no means, but this kind of shows you the progression of what's going on in the body to cause the symptoms that you see, such as the protein in the urine and, and the edema and all this stuff that you get. So um, we won't go into the patho that much, but that kind of shows you the, the cascade of events that happen. Um, so with preeclampsia, some of the symptoms that you see, um, they may have a really high, uh, I'm sorry, a headache because of their high blood pressure. Um, they may be completely asymptomatic, um, which means they come in, they have no idea, and their blood pressure is elevated, and they have protein in their urine, and they had no idea, um, which is more likely the case that you see. So they may have... Um, like I said, headache. Um, another thing that you see is edema, um, very common with preeclampsia, significant edema. Uh, but the difference in their edema is location. So most women um, get some level of edema um, when they are pregnant. Um, 
but this is usually going to be um, dependent edema in your feet and in your legs. Um, for patients with preeclampsia, they get more likely um, edema in their hands and their face. So if they have uh, facial or hand edema, that's very concerning for potentially having preeclampsia. So it's diagnosed with, um, again, the between the blood pressure reading and the protein in the urine on the urinalysis. Um, on page 63, it talks about your um, magnesium sulfate, which is a big drug that we give um, for preeclampsia. And the reason that we give this drug is not for the hypertension. Um, it may affect the blood sugar, I mean, I'm sorry, the blood pressure a little bit, but not extensively. Um, what we're really giving mag sulfate for is to prevent seizures, prevent them from developing eclampsia. Um, so as you've learned in your other courses, mag mellows, mag calms everything down. We'll talk about magnesium again in labor and delivery because it also is used to stop preterm labor, hopefully. Um, um, but in this case, we're giving it to calm those nerves down. So page 63, it talks about magnesium. You should know magnesium well um, because you will see it a lot in this class as moving forward. Um, so as far as diagnostic testing, again, if they see protein in the urine, they'll do often send the mom home with a 24-hour urine um, to, to make sure they're getting the most accurate information. Um, and then with that diagnosis, uh, treatment can vary. Um, if she is tolerating well, she may be able to just be on mild activity restrictions at home or it could in diet um, reduce sodium. You don't want to reduce fluids because fluids are an important part of maintaining a healthy pregnancy, but they'll often often tell them to reduce their sodium, they may be able to maintain at home, or it might be so severe that they have to be on bed rest in the hospital setting. Um, and these are usually women that are getting those magnesium sulfate drips. So when we have a patient on magnesium sulfate, there's a couple of important, um, well, there's several, but there's two big important assessment things that we're doing. One of the big ones is deep tendon reflexes, and that's the biggest one we associate it with. And we're checking them frequently, usually every 15 minutes if they're actively getting a magnesium sulfate drip. Um, and we're making sure that they're not get, becoming too hyporeflexive, because if they do, it could indicate too much magnesium. Same thing with respiratory rate really being meticulous about counting that respiratory rate and making sure it's accurate uh, because decreases in the respiratory rate can also indicate magnesium toxicity. Um, and because of that, we always want to make sure we have calcium gluconate on hand um, in case they do develop magnesium toxicity as the antidote. So as far as management of blood pressure, there may not be any management of blood pressure other than um, more conservative measures like decreasing stimulation and bed rest and things like that. As far as medications, um, those are reserved for if the blood pressure is really significantly high to cause serious complications. And the reason for this is most of your blood pressure medications not only decrease your blood pressure, but they decrease your heart rate. And these do cross the placental barrier and affect babies, so they can affect baby's heart rate. So unless their blood pressure is really sky high, they often avoid those blood pressure medications um, and use other measures such as decreased stimulation. So it can develop, not always, but sometimes it can develop into something we call eclampsia. Um, eclampsia is where they develop seizures, coma, um, or even death. <laughs> so kind of like you hear about sodium, seizure, coma, death. It's very similar. Um, so eclampsia is where they do have that seizure as um, that hyper irritability of the nerves in the brain um, continues. Um, so it can be sudden um, or it can be almost like aura type symptoms where they feel like something's going to happen. Um, it is not associated with how high the blood pressure is. So somebody with a blood pressure of 150 over 90 could have this 
happen just as easily as somebody with a blood pressure of 200 over 110. Um, it is when we're caring for those patients in the initial seizure period, same thing we do for any seizure patient, um, making sure we are um, keeping them safe, um, turning them on their side, and, and timing the seizure. Other than that, it's not going to change, and then uh, we can increase their magnesium even while they're having the seizure, so hopefully it kind of calms those things down. So our next condition that you can see is hyperemesis gravidarum. So hyperemesis gravidarum is not the normal nausea and vomiting that many women get while they're pregnant. This is a more severe, extreme form. Um, these are women that often have to be hospitalized, sometimes multiple times, um, because of the severity of their, their emesis, um, or they may get home home health treatments. Um, so the three criteria that identify hyperemesis gravidarum versus normal nausea and vomiting are weight loss, electrolyte imbalances, and dehydration. So if they are having significant enough of vomiting to cause those problems, that's where you start running into potential complications for mom and or baby. So unfortunately, there is no... Um, cure for this, but you can't get rid of it. Um, the only cure for this is time. So they have to wait until it resolves on its own. Usually, I say textbook, usually around 20 to 22 weeks of gestation is when it starts to resolve. But there are some women that it never goes away until they give birth to their baby. So it can last the entire pregnancy. Um, again, you can do home health measures. Um, the biggest thing is making sure they're getting fluids. So they often need IV fluids, whether it's in the hospital or through home health. Um, the pump you see on the bottom middle picture, um, this is a way that you can give continuous Zofran. So they can use this pump um, to get a continuous dose of Zofran, kind of like an ins the way an insulin pump works. And that can help ma manage their symptoms um, of the nausea and vomiting and sometimes allow them to be able to keep sips down. Um, other than that, it's just a waiting game until it goes away. So last week we talked about intentional abortions, or when we talked about um, preg normal pregnancy, we talked about, in, um, I'm sorry, infertility, we talked about intentional abortions. Um, in the layperson world, usually what people call spontaneous abortions is miscarriages. Um, but in the OB world, any loss of a pregnancy before 20 weeks is called an abortion, whether it was an intentional abortion or whether it was a um, unintentional abortion, also known as a spontaneous abortion. So there's different types of abortions based on their characteristics. You see this in page 42 in your ATI book in a chart. Um, and it is characterized by the, the characteristics you see. For example, if they have vaginal bleeding, um, but the cervix is still closed, it's only a threatened abortion because there is a potential that that fetus could survive. Once that cervix starts to open, you can't save that pregnancy. Um, but if it's still closed, it could be um, that you could save that pregnancy. Spontaneous abortion is the most common cause of um, vaginal bleeding in the first trimester. Um, the most common cause of spontaneous abortions in the first trimester is genetic defects. So when we're talking about fetal development, by the time you get to the end of the first trimester at 13 weeks, every single body part has been developed. All the parts are there um, at the end of the first trimester. Um, it's just you use the second and third trimester for things to grow and get bigger and stronger um, and more developed. So during that first trimester, when everything is developing, if the body sees that something's not developing appropriately or a genetic defect is caught, then that's where a lot of those spontaneous abortions come in. So the most common cause of spontaneous abortions in the first trimester is some kind of genetic defect with the baby um, that may not be compatible with life. Um, when we're going into the second and third trimester abortions, more commonly, um, it is something called cervical incompetence. Um, cervical incompetence is unfortunate because there's no way to test for it. There's no way to know you have it until you have a spontaneous abortion because of it. Or st in this case, it would be a stillbirth um, due to it being later on after the 20 weeks oftentimes, um, although it could be earlier. Um, so what happens with cervical incompetence is their cervix starts to open up prematurely um, at, at a time in the pregnancy where the baby would not be viable. 
Um, and unfortunately, once a cervix starts to dilate, there's nothing you can do about it. You can't stitch it back together. Um, you can't sew it. You can't do anything. Um, it's too late. Um, so women sometimes have to have multiple miscarriages before it is found that this is their problem. Um, and there's no way to test for it until it happens. Luckily, once you know that's the problem, it can be prevented. So they'll do something called a cerclage, which is like a band or they will um, suture the cervix closed and they'll do it early around 13 or 14 weeks in the pregnancy because you want to make sure it happens before that cervix starts to open um, and they'll leave it there until about 38 weeks of pregnancy so that way that cervix cannot open and then at 38 weeks when she's full term they'll take it off so that way um, she can um, have a vaginal birth normally with no problems. So one type of pregnancy that is incompatible um, with a live birth is called an ectopic pregnancy. So um, when most people think of ectopic pregnancies, they think of a um, pregnancy that implants into into the fallopian tube, which a large majority of them are in the fallopian tube, about 95%. Um, but um, a ectopic pregnancy means it is implanted not inside the uterus. So if you look at the top picture on this slide, it shows you a lot of different places that this can happen. It can happen on the outside of the tube, the outside of the uterus, on the ovary, on the abdominal wall. Um, it can happen in lots of different places. But we'll, for our purposes of discussing symptoms, we're going to focus on tubal um, ectopic pregnancies because they are the most common ones. Um, it is a leading cause of infertility when this happens because either they have factors that also cause infertility that created the ectopic pregnancy or um, they may have to have the entire fallopian tube removed. So um, by factors, I mean when we talked in class about pelvic inflammatory disease or PID. PID causes a lot of swelling and inflammation in those upper reproductive structures, the uterus, the fallopian tubes, and the ovaries. And whenever you have inflammation, you have scarring. So the scarring is left behind even after the PID has been treated and it can occlude that fallopian tube. So uh, if it's not fully occluded, the opening may be large enough for sperm to get in and um, conceive with the egg, but then the opening is not large enough for that um, egg to then get back out. So it implants into the fallopian tube. Um, the Treatment for this is removal of the fetus. There's no way it can be re-implanted into the proper place. Once it implants in the wrong place, it has to be um, it has to be aborted. So it can be aborted medically, um, which this is more reserved for early pregnancies, usually with metho methotrexate, which will cause um, fetal. Um, fetal demise and or at that point it's still an embryo embryo demise and it will um cause that type of abortion or it could be surgical where they have to actually go in and either remove the fetus or depending on how large it is um possibly the whole tube as well so symptoms of this usually start around six to eight weeks of pregnancy um they're still pregnant so they'll have all the other symptoms of pregnancy they'll have a menorrhea they'll have the nausea and the breast tenderness and the fatigue and all the symptoms you have of pregnancy so they're not going to know that they have an ectopic pregnancy until they start having these other symptoms so the other symptoms they may experience around six to eight weeks are unilateral um, pain in their abdomen which Whatever side that that embryo attached to, they'll start having pain because of it pressing on that fallopian tube, and they'll often have spotting bleeding. They're not going to have heavy bleeding unless that tube ruptures, and that's a different scenario. But just the implantation, they'll have spotting of bleeding, and that can be an indicator that something is wrong. This is not going to be something that can become a viable pregnancy. So one thing that most people have not heard of before is called a hydatiform mole or a molar pregnancy or a gestational trophoblastic disease as it calls it in your ATI book. Um, so this is not a fetus. This is not going to grow into a fetus. It will never rectify itself. So you can have completes or partials. Um, and this is 
something happened in the conception of this baby. Either there was an abnormality with the sperm or um, sometimes with like two sperm, try to fertilize the same egg at the same time. It can happen where this develops. So this is where you have cells that are replicating rapidly, but they're not differentiating into different types of cells. So instead of having, you know, heart cells and brain cells and intestinal cells, you have just these undifferentiated cells, almost kind of like you see in a tumor which this is not a tumor, uh, but it kind of replicates in the same fashion. Um, so on ultrasound, if you look at the bottom picture, it just looks like a cluster of grapes. Um, and if you look at the top pictures, even the one that's a partial where it looks like a viable fetus, it would not be a viable fetus. Um, so these will have to result in termination. Um, a lot of times they self-terminate. They will have a spontaneous abortion because um, their body, will, as things develop, their body recognizes it's not a viable fetus. <laughs> and it will um, cause a spontaneous abortion. Um, so this may be caught in the first trimester, but more than likely it's going to be caught early second trimester. Um, and the symptom that you see most commonly with this um, is a brown or reddish prune juice-like discharge. So it's going to be a dark brown or reddish dark reddish um, prune juice like discharge that you see with this not usually pain um, they're more likely to have things like hyperemesis with this just because of the high levels of hcg that this produces and hcg increases your risk of hyperemesis um, they may also have um, that their abdomen is expanding much more rapidly than you would expect based on their gestation so um, but the big one is that prune juice like discharge So let's talk about placenta previa versus placental abruption. Um, they are two very different things with potentially very different outcomes. Placenta previa is just where the placenta is low lying. So it can be um, partial um, or marginal, what we call it. If you look at that middle diagram on the picture, um, it's not actually covering the cervix, but it's very close to the cervix. And because of this, any kind of friction um, against the cervix and the placenta, um, even just from walking, can cause vaginal bleeding. Um, or it can be complete, like the picture to your right, where it completely covers that cervical os, and there is no way baby is coming out that way. So um, when we're talking about placenta previa, it is not painful. It is painless, and that's one of the big differentiating factors of placenta previa and placental abruption is pain. There's no pain with placenta previa. Um, women will usually come to the ER or their OB um, because they're having vaginal bleeding, and on ultrasound, they see the low-lying placement of the placenta, and that's how that gets diagnosed. Um, um, oftentimes, they do need bed rest, especially by the end of their pregnancy, um, because the the friction of even just walking puts so much friction on that placenta against the cervix that it can cause significant bleeding. They can have large amounts of bleeding to the point of hemorrhage. It's not necessarily small amounts of blood. Um, so as far as our treatment of this, again, oftentimes bed rest um, for these patients, um, but also no vaginal exams. So vaginal exams could potentially disrupt that placenta, causing it to pull away um, or bleed worse. Worse, um, and they cannot deliver vaginally, especially if they obviously if they have a complete placenta previa, there is something blocking the path, <laughs> the placenta, and they're not going to come out that way. Even with a marginal placenta previa, because of their risk of placental abruption, that can then um, be a complication because of it being so close. Um, they may choose to do a elective cesarean section with that one as well, just because of the high risk of bleeding versus placental abruption is painful. This is where the placenta is pulling away from the uterus too soon. Um, so it is pulling away and it is causing bleeding. Um, and you may see the bleeding um, if it's on the edge, like the picture you see on the left, you'll see bleeding. So what we call a revealed abruption. But it can also pull away from the center of the placenta. So it creates like a pocket. So because the edges are still sealed, you won't see that. So instead of seeing 
actual vaginal bleeding, you'll start seeing baby drop in their heart rate, for example, or mama's vital signs changing, and those can be a sign of bleeding as well. Um, so placental eruption is painful. Think of tearing of tissue. Tearing of tissue hurts. Um, the most common cause of placental eruption is hypertension. So whether they have hypertension like you get with preeclampsia or they have hypertension related to, for example, cocaine use, um, the most common cause is hypertension that causes this. And the only treatment for this is emergency C-section because you don't have time to go through the labor process um, if they're having an abruption. Um, baby is going to start to decompensate and depending on the size of it, it could be a rapid decompensation. So um, they are going to want to get baby out of there as soon as possible. So the last complication that can develop during pregnancy is infections. Um, and we talked a lot about sexually transmitted infections and how they can affect pregnancy already. Um, so we won't go into those in too, de too much detail, but we, we're going to talk about torch infections. So torch infections are specific infections that can cause teratogenic effects, meaning they cause either fetal death or they can cause permanent complications in that fetus if mama contracts those infections while she's pregnant. Um, so torch stands for toxoplasmosis. Toxoplasmosis is the one that you think of that pregnant women are not supposed to change litter boxes because of. Um, other incorporates, um, there's several that go under other, but um, a lot of the other ones are your tick-borne and uh, mosquito-borne diseases like Lyme's disease, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, Zika virus. Um, Zika would fall under that other. Um, then you have rubella. Um, rubella immunizations they can't get during pregnancy. Hopefully they're already immune to it prior to pregnancy. Um, but if they contract rubella during pregnancy, it can cause permanent complications. Cytomegalovirus, also called CMV. Um, mom may be asymptomatic, but it can cause, especially neuro, you see a lot of permanent neuro problems with CMV. And then herpes as well. Herpes can cause everything from neuro complications to fetal death. Um, there was a baby a couple of years ago who was at the, the parents' uh, wedding. A family member was holding baby, kissed baby. Had The family member had an active oral herpes infection. Um, and baby died of encephalitis because of the contraction of that herpes. Most of us would not die from herpes. Um, it is permanent and doesn't go away. But most of us wouldn't die from it unless we had immune compromise like HIV, for example. But in babies, they don't have that immune system to protect them. So these infections can cause permanent problems um, and should be avoided as much as possible. Um, as far as urinary tract infections, urinary tract infections aren't a great thing to have by no means, and you can become septic from them. Um, but in pregnancy, they can stimulate preterm labor. So urinary tract infections, bacterial vaginosis, and dehydration all are very common causes of preterm labor um, because of the inflammatory process that it's stimulating in the body. It stimulates contractions of the uterus. So um, it's very important that urinary tract infections are treated promptly um, because if they aren't, it can stimulate preterm labor. And then group beta strep. We didn't really go into group beta strep when we were talking about vaginal infections because our discussion, it's more pertinent to pregnancy. So in pregnancy um, is the only time this is really concerning. Many women have group beta strep or GBS that live in their vaginas. It's not the same strep that gives you strep throat, that's group A strep. So group B strep um, lives in women's vaginas. It's dormant. It doesn't cause issues. It doesn't cause any kind of symptoms. It just kind of lives there um, as its habitat. Um, the problem becomes is if baby passes through the birth canal and mom is positive for GBS. If baby picks that up, they can become septic and they can get pretty sick. Um, so all women are tested for GBS usually between 35 and 37 weeks of just station. Um, so that way they know when they go to the hospital if they're positive. They don't treat them when they test for it because they could re-get um, that illness before they actually go and have the baby. And it's during labor that it's the concern. So once they're GBS positive, when they go into the hospital, they'll get IV antibiotics, ideally starting at least four hours prior to birth. So that way it's in their system and has killed the infection um, and decreases the risk of being, it being transmitted to mom.
So on page 47 in your ATI book is where a lot of these infections are discussed, um, especially your torch infections. I highly recommend that you review your torch infections.